Hello, BookTube. I am doing a read-along along with uh, Jordan, Jordan Parsons, uh, on his channel, of this, Never Call Retreat, the third volume in historian Bruce Catton's three-volume Centennial History of the American Civil War. Uh, this is, I don't know how many times I've read this book. It's Jordan's first time reading it. It's fantastic reading. It's fantastic history. Uh, and we, this book, obviously, since the third book in the trilogy, covers the end of the war. Uh, and that's what we're reading today. We're reading uh, chapters five and six, and then we will devote all of next week uh, to chapter seven. And uh, I want to start, I know that we're, that we're reading, you know, we're going forward in, in subject matter, but I want to start by looking backwards at uh, the video that I made last week. Uh, which was about the previous two chapters, which had massive savage fighting at places like Chickamauga and Chattanooga, but which has as its centerpiece necessarily the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, which I talked about at length, uh, Catton gives it a fairly good account. It's amazing that he doesn't spend more time on it than he does. Most historians do. Uh, but in that discussion, in that video last week, I mentioned my frustration that the Union General George Gordon Meade did not pursue his advantage once he had repulsed Lee's incredibly stupid attack towards the center of his lines in order to strike at Lee's army. I mentioned that Lee's army was far more important than Lee's home bases or the capital of the Confederacy and that Meade was grossly derelict not to do that. Now, quite a few of you emailed me, quite a few Civil War buffs emailed me and said that Meade wasn't in a position to do that and a few of you pointed out that he did want to but it didn't happen. Uh, and I wanted to read a passage here. I love reading Catton anyway, but I wanted to read a passage where he addresses that very subject. Uh, before we move on to the chapters that we're, well, I mean, this is part of the chapters that we're reading today, but this is dealing with the subject matter that we've already covered. When this is, this is Catton writing about the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, Lee devoted his energy to a center attack at the center of a well-fortified high ground position. A foolish, foolish endeavor it could not possibly have worked. All it, it did was waste his men. And when those men, the remnants of them, came staggering back, shattered, he then withdrew his army from the field. Uh, when Lee crossed the Potomac on his way south from Gettysburg, Meade followed, going east of the Blue Ridge and planning to strike Lee's flank when the Confederate army came through the mountain passes. Meade maneuvered skillfully, and late in July he found the opening he wanted at Manassas Gap, with almost half of Lee's army east of the Blue Ridge and the rest of it still trying to get out of the Shenandoah Valley. The opportunity was glittering, but Meade tripped over the same thing that had tripped an earlier general, inability to get a subordinate to execute a good battle plan. He ordered the new commander of his third corps, Major General William French, to go through the gap and attack with a vigorous blow, and a vigorous blow might very well have disposed of Ewell's corps, and possibly a good part of A.P. Hills, and this, coming on the heels of the terrible losses at Gettysburg, would almost certainly have been have brought down the curtain on the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's army. Uh, but French skirmished weakly with one brigade when he should have struck with his entire corps, backed by all the rest of the army, which was coming up fast, and the opportunity quickly vanished. Lee brought his separated corps together safely and took up a good defensive position south of the Rapidan River. And here, halfway between the two capitals, separated by a river that had seen much campaigning and would see much more, the two armies caught their breath and waited to see what would happen next. Uh, and uh, th that, is, that is Catton addressing the subject of what me did or didn't do, should or shouldn't have done. But I want to point out uh, that my subordinate did not obey his orders does not excuse a commanding general. <laughs> I can find a new subordinate. They're, they're dropping off the trees. You find a new subordinate to do it. And also, I want to point out, Catton has a predisposition, most mid-century historians had a predisposition to like the South, to like the Confederacy, certainly to be impressed by the heroism of the Southern generals and the ordinary Southern enlisted man, who by this point in the war was campaigning in bare feet uh, on virtually no provender. Uh, against a far superior opponent, it's tough not to see an, air, an element of romanticism in that. Uh, this causes Catton to want to balance the sides and sometimes to soften his punches when it comes to the South. He doesn't do it often. He's very uh, stern 
assessor of good and bad generalship, which is what you're dealing with when you're dealing with the Civil War. Uh, but here, what is that soft peddling about Lee having a good defensive position on the Rapidan River? That is just soft peddling. Meade out, out, outnumbered him three to one, at least. His men were fresher. A lot of them hadn't fought at Gettysburg. He had better equipment. He had an unbroken supply line. I don't care what Lee's position was on the Rapidan River, and I don't care what, what you know, Lieutenant General French did. Meade should have got his forces together outside of the Blue Ridge Mountains and then struck immediately, strike immediately. He wasn't that kind of a general. Uh, Catton makes that clear throughout and assesses him accurately, I think. But it, the idea suggested in that passage, which is that the opportunity to destroy the Army of Northern Virginia vanished in that moment when French disobeyed his orders, is nonsense. It was still there. Lee wasn't going to back away any further. Meade was within easy striking distance and had the total tactical and strategic advantage. He should have taken advantage of that. He didn't do it. But I'm just going to leave that there. You want to argue with me, feel free to email me. I love it. I absolutely love it. You can count on civil war buffs uh, to completely disagree with what you're saying, but be civil about it, no pun intended. Uh, but uh, getting on to the chapters, that mainly the main meat of the chapters that we're reading uh, today, inevitably, as you know already, just from the fact this is the third book in the trilogy, we are dealing here now uh, with a war of attrition. Now, it didn't, it wasn't completely obvious that that's what it was on the final day of Gettysburg. It certainly wasn't visible that it was that during the meat grinder of uh, Chickamauga or Chattanooga, but it's nevertheless true. And I believe that every single professional looking at maps or reading dispatches knew that by this point in the war. Vicksburg had fallen. Sherman was moving at will in the deep south right along the south of supply lines that absolutely were vital to it keeping any armies in the field or supplying Richmond. He was moving unopposed by Johnson. He was moving at will. And uh, that was just getting worse. And there was no way to stop it from getting worse. The, the North was slowly, methodically choking the Confederacy to death, mainly by cutting one railroad after another. That's not only how you move troops, that's how you move supplies for men and horses. If you don't have those, you are stuck. You are in a very small theater, able only to move in the direction where your enemies aren't but never to, mount an, never to mount an offensive, never to do anything else, certainly not to dig in. And that is inevitably happening here in the chapters that we're reading today. Absolutely inevitable. Which you would think would prompt the South, under the leadership of Jefferson Davis, to sue for peace. And they do. Catton it, it des describes some tentative feelers that were put out for peace and whatnot, but on completely unacceptable grounds. We saw that last time, I quoted you a passage last time, that the, the, the least that uh, Abraham Lincoln, the most that Abraham Lincoln would concede was much more than Jefferson Davis would even consider succeeding. Jefferson Davis wanted, as he said many times, for the South to be let alone. That was the thing that he would consider, and only that. that the South, he wanted the South to be let alone, to live their own life as they did in the olden days. And the whole point of Abraham Lincoln's uh, re-election, he's re-elected in these chapters, the whole point of his view of the war is that there were 750,000 people in the, in the Old South who weren't let alone. Being a slave is the very definition of not being let alone. That is unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable that you be a separate nation within the United States. Uh, which means that at the beginning of these chapters that we're reading, the two forces are in completely irreconcilable corners, so it seems. Uh, Bratton, the captain actually mentions, uh, when, when dealing with negotiations, he says the only negotiators now were the men with guns in their hands. And because there was no longer anything for anyone else to negotiate, the very least Mr. Davis would accept was precisely the thing his opponent would not concede at any price. Uh, which means uh, a grinding war of attrition battle after battle after battle, including a major battle in which Lee and Grant face each other directly, not subordinates, where they, they, they face each other. It ends up not making a difference. Lee has often been extolled as being some sort of uh, tactical genius uh, with the audacity to split his army in the face of an enemy on even ground. That is 
absolutely forbidden in military technical manuals. I have seen very little evidence of that. I've read a lot of Civil War battle histories. I've read a lot of biographies of Robert E. Lee. I've seen very little evidence of that. That seems to me to be part and parcel of what I was talking about, where you, you, soft, you soften the blows that are going into your assessment of the South. Uh, we'll get to that next week. <laughs> Believe you me, we will. Uh, but uh, as Catton points out in these chapters, it basically boils down to just Lee and Grant fighting each other wherever they come anywhere near each other. It becomes a long months and months of just almost continuous fighting. Uh, and Catton touches down on the details of those, of those battles, those skirmishes and encounters quite often. And always with a particular tone that I wanted to bring to your attention. He's mentioning here uh, a division commander of uh, Franz Siegel, a Union division commander. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he, he mentions uh, Franz Siegel here and describes him in a way that I want to, uh, that I want to point out to you. He describes him as a fretful, intellectually wizened sort who knew war by the books, but could not handle it when he met it in person. Now, that is a fantastic way to word that. Uh, and it crops up throughout this book and throughout a lot that Catton wrote about the American Civil War. And I want to point out something here. Uh, it's a little delicate. Catton hits this note a lot about people who know war in books, but have never met it in person and don't react well when they do. I want to point out, Bruce Catton never heard a shot fired in anger. For whatever that's worth, good or bad, whether that explains this persistent kind of commentary or not, I just wanted, just wanted to point that out. Uh, but, uh, like I mentioned, these chapters give us an epic confrontation. They give us Lee and Grant fighting each other directly. Uh, and Catton writes uh, about that. One thing was clear. Grant and Lee did not make war in the style of Sherman and his opponent, Johnston. Uh, sparring cautiously and looking for openings, they simply looked for each other, and as soon as they found each other, they began to fight. Neither man had yet met anyone like the other. Uh, which is probably true, but in this case, fatal to the South. Absolutely fatal. Because the South has no material benefits. They have no uh, deep bench at all. And Grant is a man-wasting butcher. Say what you want about his tactical or strategic brilliance, but his his approach to almost any military imbroglio was to throw men at it until it broke, with no concern for uh, how many people died, with no concern for his own casualties. In other words, the opposite of General McClellan. Uh, and if it sounds like I have a moral judgment in my tone, I should it shouldn't sound that way because I'm trying not to. It's war after all. And that is how wars are, are fought. I, I have never actually, on, a, on a, a deep level, I have never actually understood generals like George McClellan, who assemble, feed, care for, drill, train, and shape an army, but are unwilling to lose men. War, that is what war is all about. And Grant seems to understand that in a way that the one equivalence here that I don't think is true, I don't think Lee ever felt that way despite Pickett's charge, despite the final day of Gettysburg. I don't think he ever felt quite that detached from the cost of his commands as Grant did. Grant, I don't think, ever felt anything like that. He could put on a good show of being, you know, a dust-colored man on a gray horse, being with the men, putting on no airs, having no feathers in his bonnet, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, his record makes it pretty clear what he thought. Uh, and that, uh, that brings us to the end of chapter six. To, we are poised now for chapter seven, the finish of the book. And the end is inevitable. Lee is cut off. By the end of these chapters, he is cut off by, from, by, from almost all avenues of support or replenishment. Uh, Jefferson Davis at this time is hitting the hustings, basically take, uh, gathering huge crowds in order to say, we have enough men if you would just enlist. Our enlistments are dropping off. People are not honoring their commitments, and we are being outfought. We have, when the, he said, he says at one point in one of those stops, I don't remember if Catton writes about it, but at one of those stops, Jefferson Davis said, when the war began, 
We had more than enough men, but we didn't have enough guns to give them. Now we have plenty of guns and we don't have enough men. I'm not 100% sure that that was true, but if it was true, it was inevitable and unstoppable. You can't, you can't get a populace to volunteer for losing war. You can force them to do it. You can coerce them into doing it, but you can't get them to, to come out of their own will for a war they know is not going to be won. By this point, all hope of that was gone. All hope of, for instance, foreign interference with uh, Britain or Spain coming in on the side of the Confederacy, on the side of King Cotton, all hope of that was gone by this point. All hope of easy access to the sea or any access at all to the sea was gone. All, all, all hope of free navigation of the Mississippi River, gone. Huge armies, gone. Great tactical leaders, gone. And no one to replace them no supply of men or material, whereas the North, an infinite supply to draw. That can only end in one way, and by the time chapter 6 of this book ends, everyone knows it. So the question arises for chapter 7, which we'll read and talk about next week, the question arises then, what do you do? Now, I mentioned, and Catton mentions a few times, that the obvious answer is you sue for peace. And at as chapter six of this book ends, it doesn't look like that's possible. It looks like Jefferson Davis is asking uh, concessions. He's asking for concessions from his conqueror. You don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, and or you can't do it, and your conqueror won't let you. Lincoln has at least two incredibly formidable generals in the field, two butchers, Sherman and Grant, who are not going to let up. They're not going to observe any kind of uh, delicacy. And they know what their target is now. At long last, after years of groping, they now know what their target is. Eliminate the support for armies. Who cares what Jefferson Davis does in his cabinet in Richmond or anywhere else? No one. The armies are keeping the Confederacy alive, and they rely on livestock, provender, railways. Kill that, and you kill the rebellion. Uh, which is what this was. I should I should bear in mind. I won't stress it too much because I got a lot of emails about that as well. Oh, this is not legitimate. This is not two legitimate nations fighting each other. There's no such thing as a legitimate nation that enslaves a third of its population. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that is where we end things now. Bleak. Bleak. You have one formidable Southern general, maybe two if you count Johnston, Joe Johnson, in the field. Uh knowing that the cause is lost, knowing that their men are melting away, and that they have no, no men to replace them, and knowing that the end is carved in stone. There isn't, these were professionals, most of the, some of these, of these star professionals had fought in the Mexican War. Some of them had studied in military academies, a great deal of them had studied in, liter liter in military academies, they weren't all political appointees, they knew what this was. By this point, there, was no, there were no illusions anywhere. Lee keeps fighting. But he already knows. And that is what we're going to encounter next week, the end of the war. Uh, so I'm hoping that some of you are reading along. This is tremendous fun to be going through this with a pencil. I'm using, see, I don't know if you can see, uh, I'm using a pencil as a bookmark, which is always a sign that I'm reading a book nice and slow. I'm taking my time and noticing the little details of what the author is doing. Catton is such an amazing performer on the page. Uh, and we'll be getting to that. There are quite a few quotes coming next week. Uh, but I'm going to wrap this up for now. This is our ongoing read-along of Never Call Retreat. Uh, but I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.